and finally, by talented and limited, and I know of no one who is better prepared or is more capable of demonstrating vitality and limited than Dr. J.R. Quincy. Come on, up. Dr. Quincy. 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 Dr.
there is disease in the world. And as long as any kind of a need remains, there will be some approach to that need. It is retained until that need is met by something which does a better job. Now, in speaking of things which do better jobs, we can use all sorts of illustrations. We can speak about the early days when the Victrola was first invented by Thomas Edison. The Victrola was a wonderful invention. They could record music and put this little gramophone down and listen to it, and it would play music to them. They could hear people's voices. But you had to wind the thing up, and the fidelity of it was limited, and there were a number of limitations to the Victrola. And uh, not too long after the Victrola, there came the radio. And the radio had to fulfill the need a little bit better because it did, a, it did a better job. The radio was capable of a greater range of entertainment. It carried the human voice, and it carried music, and it carried it more faithfully than the Victrola would do. And of course, the radio was made available to many millions of people who didn't have or who couldn't buy a Victrola. Then radio struggled through its infancy and it gained considerable stature. And then just after World War II, television began to come into its own. Now, I don't suggest that television has reached maturity by any means. But television is replacing radio because it does a better job of communicating with people. The radio was limited to one sense, the ear. Television does a better job for a very simple reason, that it not only will communicate with the hearing of an individual, but by sight as well. We could use the example of where the feet in the field of entertainment of Bobville. In Bobville, certain things were done, but because of the limitations of the stage and because of human limitations, Bobville could only go so far, and Bobville was replaced by the movies. And the movies was a different sort of medium because the movies could present plays as well as all kinds of entertaining acrobats and all sorts of things. The movies were practically unlimited in the things they could do in the field of entertainment. If we go to a movie nowadays, we may not think so, but the, the great possibilities of movies are still being explored because it is a better new means of communication. So it's replaced something else. We could cite the example of the horse that's been used for thousands and thousands of years and how the horse was replaced by the tractor and the automobile. Now, when anything new comes along like that, it's subject to censure and ridicule. Uh, people who saw the first horse disparages would yell at them to get a horse, and there would be flat tires, and they would talk about the impracticability of such a thing as a horse disparage. And what are you going to do when you run out of gasoline? How are you going to carry enough gasoline to go on a long trip? They thought there were all kinds of limitations imposed in that with our automobiles today. Now, in anything in which there is going to be change and replacement of something old by something new which does a better job, we are just a little bit reluctant to turn loose of that thing and to let go of it completely. We don't like to let go of these old ties. There's a nostalgia for the thing which we seem to be extremely reluctant to let go of. However, a short time after the new becomes established, we eventually see that the new way is superior, and finally, we let go of the old, and it becomes nothing more than history. <clears throat> I'm having a little difficulty with the wind here. Now, let's get back to osteopathy for a minute. Apparently, osteopathy didn't answer the need that was felt, and therefore it began to lose its identity, and it is gradually and very rapidly now passing out of the picture. Naturopathy is in the same position today. How many graduates now of naturopathy are in practice? Very few. Apparently, Naturopathy is unable to answer this need. There are some other requirements that we might mention relative to the power of endurance. Perhaps we should mention principle. Anything which is new must have some sort of a principle. And anything which endures must have a timeless principle. It works at any time and under all conditions. 
That is the principle. If this is principle is correct or right, it's not subject to modification. I think the chiropractic principle qualifies here without question. In any case, at any time, the chiropractic principle works. Universal intelligence is not subject to modification. It is now and has been and always will be fixed and unchanging. I call this the great constant. In science, they're always talking about a constant. You've got to have some constant to go on. And the great constant in chiropractic is universal intelligence. That portion of universal intelligence, which is in each of us, with us, as in any intelligence, cannot be changed. The chiropractic principle is going to stand the test of time. It is a timeless principle. Another requirement which perhaps should be met for anything which is to have the power of endurance, it must be able to do the job better than anything else which has been presented previously. Well, that's what that the chiropractic approach to the problem of disease and compare our approach with other methods, mainly medicine. <clears throat> Chiropractic is based upon the principle of the restoration of very force flow. Anything less than full restoration leaves the patient in some state of disease. Well and complete health is not possible without the removal of all interference. Any method which seeks to restore health by any other means cannot accomplish the desired result. Symptoms may be masked for a time or suppressed, but the treating effects without the removal of cause cannot result in the full restoration of health. They speak of the miracle of the antibiotic drug, and they point to such things as the reduction in fever within a short length of time, when an infection, an acute infection, is present in the body. There were two children I'm thinking of in this vicinity who had an infection of the throat. And this infection of the throat resembles tonsillitis. Let's call it tonsillitis. This infection developed about the same time in each child. And the children were taken to a physician and given one of the antibiotics. And in a short length of time, within a period of about 12 hours or 24 hours, the fever that was present declined and left, and the infection seemed to clear up. And a few weeks went by, the children were in school, and they began to have some more difficulties with the throat. These children seem to be most sympathetic toward each other because when one gets sick, the other one gets sick. And they're not twins, they're brother and sister. At any rate, this infection returned and was again treated with an antibiotic. And the process was repeated three or four times. Now, apparently, in this instance, it's perfectly obvious that it was merely the treating of the infection. The condition, the cause of this infection was present all the time. Now we can give something to suppress those symptoms. And the symptoms become suppressed and the condition apparently clears up but the patient is far from being cured. Certainly there's some sort of an approach which can remove the cause of an illness rather than to suppress or to treat the effects. Another quality of endurance is growth. If the principle is correct, one of the signs of its greatness is growth. After the death of Jesus, about 33 AD, there were only a handful of Christians in the world. And you and I know the story that's been repeated over and over and over again about the growth of Christianity and the millions and millions of Christians that are in the world today. And one of the amazing things that has occurred out of World War II is the greatly accelerated growth of Christianity. Certainly, anything which has not a correct principle couldn't demonstrate the type of growth that Christianity has demonstrated for over 1900 years. Now, in less, in less than 60 years ago, 
There was one chiropractor, and he had a handful of patients. How many million people today are under chiropractic care? In the United States, approximately 20% of the population has had an adjustment or is under some form of chiropractic care. We have a population of approximately 160 million, and the estimate is that about 30 million Americans are under chiropractic care, either partially or completely. One of the signs of growth is only natural, the only natural reluctance of the patient to let go completely from their own care. How many patients have you had in the office who come in for perhaps a bad shoulder or a bad back or some difficulty like that, and they go to you very faithfully and they become well? The bad back or the bad shoulder or whatever it might be, uh, some sort of, sort of muscular or skeletal difficulty clears up, and the patient goes home a very satisfied patient. Some member of the family becomes ill with, let's say, a sore throat, and they call in a physician. And they come back to the office some time later, and they may mention casually that one of the members of the family became ill with a sore throat. And you ask them what they did about it, and they said, why, we called in our family doctor, the physician. It's only natural that in anything new there be a little reluctance on the part of patients to let go of the old. And of course, that is part of your job, the process of educating your patient to the complete principle of chiropractic. I don't think any profession anywhere can point to a growth that even approaches the growth of the chiropractic profession. As in any young thing which grows, we have our signs of immaturity. We have fights and squabbles. Sometimes in these fights and squabbles, I believe we begin to lose sight of our common goal. Remember, first and foremost, we are chiropractors, and we are trying to promote and perpetuate the chiropractic profession. And you can't do it, and I can't do it, if I've got a hold of your throat, and you've got a hold of mine. We can't fight our opposition. So sometimes in our battles, we become so blind that we lose sight of our common goal. I believe that in spite of the fact that we are at this stage immature, and a little young, perhaps foolish, that the chiropractic principle is going to grow, and it's so great that it will continue in spite of everything and anything that gets in its way. You remember before World War II, it was a great event when some national magazine would publish an article on chiropractic. Everybody would get hold of the article and pass it around. Look here, look here, we're finally getting into the print now. Uh, perhaps some of you remember just after World War II, that nasty little epistle that appeared in the Reading Digest by Albert Q. Meisel, Can Chiropractic Cure, and we were highly incensed about it. We had every right to be. But look around today a little bit. Today, just a few years later, maybe six or seven or eight years later, after that article that appeared in the Reader's Digest, scarcely a week goes by where if you don't pick up an article on chiropractic in some national magazine, I'm not able to keep up with the new one right now. I believe that right now there is a young giant arising. And this giant, which we call chiropractic, is at times awkward and gawky and even a little bit foolish. But he's strong and he's powerful in his purpose. And he's getting so big now that no one can deny that he's here to stay. He has this power of endurance. One of the definitions of endurance is the power to continue in the same state without perishing. And I certainly believe this giant is going to endure. I'm proud to be a member of a profession 
which is just such a giant. The vitality of chiropractic will carry it through all of time and all of space to become the greatest of all professions. Sometimes it's nice to talk behind somebody's back.